Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our stargazing lecture here at Caltech Astronomy. I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. I'll be your MC and host for this evening's event. Um, a few announcements before we get started. So uh, these events take place once a month. We we skipped last month. Um, I was out of town and so couldn't run it, but we'll have our next one of these in three weeks time on Friday, December 8th. And the topic of that presentation will be black holes, black holes by a new professor here, um, Dr. Kareem El Badri, who just joined the department. So it should be really exciting. Uh, in addition to these events, we also have the Astronomy on Tap events that take place once a month on Monday nights in Old Town, Pasadena. There's a restaurant bar down there called The Dog House that serves hamburgers and hot dogs and, and beers. And we take over their bar one, one night a month on Mondays where we host uh, two 15 minute public science talks on different topics given by local researchers, either here at Caltech or NASA JPL or the Carnegie Observatories. And, and uh, so 15, two 15 minute presentations, there's astronomy themed pub trivia with prizes. There's also telescopes and there's, there's live music as well. So um, our next one of those will be in two and a half weeks on Monday, December 4th. And the two presentations will be on dust astrophysical dust it's not just dust that gets on your mantelpiece that that it is annoying to clean up but dust is actually throughout the universe and causes a variety of different effects in our ability to see things over vast distances through interstellar and intergalactic space so um that will be one of the presentations the other presentation will be on the topic of this project it's called project starshot it's where we're trying to actively launch little uh nanoscale probes physically moving them to the nearest star system alpha centauri that's about three or four light years away so um, one of the researchers here at caltech is working on that project and it should be really interesting to hear about that um did people get to see the solar eclipse that took place a month and a half or so ago it was pretty cool right um, and you probably already know, but there will be a solar eclipse that's uh, visible up as a partial eclipse from here in California, much like it was last month. But if you go to the central and eastern parts of the country on April 8th, Monday, April 8th, 2024, there will be a total solar eclipse, in which case, if you're at the right place at the right time, the, during the daytime, the, the moon will cover up the sun and it'll get totally dark, where, to the point where you can see planets and stars in the sky and and crickets start chirping and it's it's a pretty surreal experience so if you have the opportunity to go see that i would recommend it it's a it's a pretty mesmerizing experience okay i think those are all of my announcements for now um yeah our schedule for tonight we'll have a 30-minute presentation by our speaker on stellar tantrums followed by uh five or ten minutes of q a and then we'll immediate tr immediately transition into having a q a astrophysicist panel consisting of our speaker myself and two other members of the department who work on different areas of astronomy and physics and we'll be hosting we'll be taking questions from all of you about you know content of the presentation as well as just any questions you might have about astronomy or space science or physics and we can do our best to to field those and provide some sort of response or at least a conversation about about some of the wild things that are happening throughout our universe um, normally we set up telescopes during that period as well so you're free to come come and listen to the q a or interact with us as well as go out to the telescopes. But as you may have seen when you were walking up, it's quite cloudy. And the expectation is that there's this uh, atmospheric river that's coming into the west coast of, of the United States, dumping an enormous amount of moisture in the next 36 hours. So um, we had one telescope set up for a few minutes out front, but it quickly became clouded out to the point where we couldn't even see Jupiter, which is a shame because Jupiter's nice and bright and, and uh, visible tonight. But if for some reason it clears up, we'll, we'll try and get the telescopes running, but don't, don't hold your breath. It looked like it was going to be cloudy and raining for the, most of the rest of the evening. So, um, okay. Okay, so our speaker for tonight originally hails from Hong Kong and did his undergraduate studies at Carleton College in Minnesota before he actually went into industry and he worked for Amazon for a year as a software developer 
uh, before then rejoining academia and becoming a member of the, the department here as a PhD student. He is a fifth year PhD candidate, sixth, forgive me, no shame, I was seven, so that's that, you're, you're, you're good to go. Um, a six year PhD candidate and he's finishing this next spring, so soon you'll be able to refer to him as, uh, as doctor. But for now, please welcome proto-doctor Yuping Huang. Well, thank you, Cameron, for the introduction. And um, raise your hand if, if you find me to be too loud, OK? Sometimes I get overexcited. But well, thank you all for coming. And um, let's start off by talking about Aurora. How many of you, just curious, have seen Aurora in real life? Raise your hand, please. A good number of you are incredibly lucky. I have not seen one yet, and I very much would like to see it. It's one of the prettiest things. I think, on Earth. And so our story today starts with Aurora. And in order to talk about Aurora, we got to start with the sun. This is the sun. Uh, it does not, I don't know, I don't know if that's what you think of what the sun looks like. Um, it's typically that warm and fuzzy ball in the, in the sky that's, you know, there warming you up, making you happy. But it is also a bubbly dynamic magnetic soup. I was gonna say mess, but. So the sun has a magnetic field, um, much like Earth. Um, it does have a large dipolar structure, like a bar magnet, but because it's hot, um, there's a lot of bubbly things going on. And some of you might recognize things like a sunspot, which are these dark spots um, basically spots where the sun's magnetic fields are exceptionally strong. And so what ends up happening is that the magnetic field of the sun ends up being kind of messy. And the lines here basically trace the directions of magnetic field. Basically, if you drop a compass needle in there, which way it would point? And it's messy, and it's constantly changing. And once in a while, or sometimes, happens more often than, than I make it out to be. Some of them run into each other and get entangled with each other. Kind of like this. Um, have, have people try pulling on rubber bands and then just keep pulling? What, what happens next? It snaps, it hurts. Um, so, so what happens, is, well, a way you can think of it is that there is energy stored inside the rubber bands, and as you pull it in opposite directions, it eventually snaps and, re and releasing that energy, making you hurt. And magnetic fields in the sun are kind of like that. So if you think of these as magnetic field lines that we saw before, if you have them pulling each other in different directions, you are going to end up with them snapping and releasing a huge amount of energy. And when that happens, um, there's also a lot of protons and electrons. They're all charged in the solar atmosphere. And it's video time. Uh, here we go. And here, the red stuff is electrons, negatively charged. And then the blue stuff is protons, heavier, moving slower. But what ends up happening is that what you have is a ton of stored magnetic energy getting converted into um, motions of these particles and they get accelerated going in all the different directions. And when that happens, you end up with quite a bit of space weather and you end up with phenomena like a solar flare. Here you can actually see some of the field lines and I want you to pay attention to like stuff up here. There's a large scale field. There's more going, there's, there's more forming and then you start having what's called a flare where the sun gets much brighter. And you can notice that the, the field that was, that was previously there went away. So the field reorganized itself, they pull on each other, release a ton of energy, heated up things, and the sun got brighter. That's a solar flare, which we do see. Another phenomenon that's related when, electro, when particles get accelerated by magnetic reconnection is corona mass ejection. So. Looks like that. You have a well, you have a giant ball of material that is being accelerated by magnetic reconnection, and it eventually leaves the sun. 
and sometimes they do come at us. And so this is a cartoon of um, Earth, our home, the sun. Usually we are showered in just a constant bath of charged particles from the sun. It's called a solar wind. And whenever there is a solar eruption, like a corona mass ejection, where you get that huge ball of plasma coming at you, what happens is that that's eventually going to hit onto the magnetic field of Earth. Some of it gets diverted, and some of it actually gets redirected toward the polar regions of, the, of Earth. Earth is atmosphere at really high velocity, and they interact with molecules in Earth is atmosphere, and they make aura. And one of, well, let me just say, one of the most, well, one of the, well, the most spectacular um, uh, corona mass ejection that has been recorded, recorded in print was the Carrington event of um, 1859. And I think there's a little, little snippet from, um, well, back then, um, when there were local newspapers, the weekly, the Weekly West from Missouri about sums it up. So it's a telegraph from Boston that says, the oral display of last night was so brilliant after midnight that ordinarily print could be read by its light. It considerably impeded the working of telegraph lines and its effects were continued up to noon today. The oral occurrence from East and West was so regular that operators on the eastern lines could send messages to the city without the usual batteries being applied. So there are two things that happen in this giant um, solar storm slash corona mass ejection. One, you see very, very bright aura all the way down to Boston. And in fact, there are records of um, aura being seen all the way down south to Columbia that year. And the other thing is that you're getting electrical currents where you don't want them or need them to be. I, for example, um, telegraph lines when you don't have batteries. And you can imagine if such a, if such a corona mass ejection hits Earth today, that's going to wreak havoc to a whole lot of infrastructures that we have, um, starting from satellites in space and um, electrical grid because you're generating currents and overloading infrastructures. And in fact, I think it was in 1989, uh, corona mass ejection caused a blackout in Quebec. And going down, you're gonna have um, currents as well and pipelines and cables under the ocean. Not a good situation. That's why there's a whole lot of resources being devoted to the study of space weather and how to mitigate their impacts. But I'm an astronomer. Um, I, I, I would like us to step back and think about, well, what's the impact of these energetic particles on, well, planet formations in general? And so we go to our neighbor, Mars. So um, th these are results from MAVEN, which was a probe that was sent to Mars in 2013 and um, orbited Mars. And one of the most spectacular results that came from MAVEN was that it actually observed solar wind particles, here shown in color, basically hitting on to Mars's atmosphere, which is tenuous, and basically um, bringing molecules in Mars's atmosphere away from it. And so as you might or might not know, um, there are traces of water, well, traces of the existence of water in the past on Mars. There are like things that look like canals and stuff like that. Um, but it does not have water currently as we know it. And one, of the, and one of the, the theories is that it used to have a much denser atmosphere that kept it warm and eventually lost its atmosphere and it lost its water with it. And the leading contender for why that happened are part, energetic particles from the sun. And here's just showing an artistic impression of Mars being bombarded by these energetic particles and um, taking its atmosphere away with it. So in addition to eroding um, atmospheres of planets, energetic particles from suns and other stars are also 
a threat to some building blocks of life. So there has been, so, so we know that Earth has an ozone, which shows us from the most dangerous of ultraviolet, which, you know, our dermatologists tell us to, to, to protect ourselves from, because skin cancer. Um, but it also, it, it, uh, but, uh, but ultraviolet also interferes with uh, replications of DNAs and things like that. And our ozone does shield us from the most dangerous of them. And it turns out that if you get enough energetic protons into an atmosphere, it catalyzes a reaction that can potentially destroy an ozone on the planet. And that's bad news. And in addition, um, energetic particles, if you have protons or neutrons um, that's cruising through biological tissues, um, can potentially sever DNA molecules. And DNA molecules is where um, we encode the genetic information of living organisms. And if they get broken, you cannot reproduce um, reliably. And that would be a potential threat to life as well. Stepping back even more, there are only so many planets in the sun. The sun is only one star. There are so many other stars out there. What, what about, what about, what about, um, what about the particles, environments, and other stars and what they do to their planets? And so let's talk about our neighbor, um, Proxima Centauri, or, well, or Alpha Centauri. Um, that was what Cameron was talking about. People were playing on sending probes to. It's the closest star to us. It happens to be a red dwarf star or an M dwarf star. It's a main sequence star, but it is redder because it's cooler than our sun. It's also much, much smaller. And as a result, what we call a habitable zone, which is the area around the star where you would expect liquid water and conditions that are uh, more favorable to life, it's much, much, much closer to the star. And here's an example of Earth's orbit around the sun and one of the planets in, in the Proxima system, Proxima B, which is in, in its habitable zone, orbiting around Proxima. So it's a lot closer. The distance there is, um, the orbital distance there is to scale. So why do we care about red dwarfs like um, Proxima? <clears throat> well, it turns out that there are a lot of them. There are about 70% of the stars in the galaxy, and therefore, wherever you look, there's got to be some red dwarfs. And it's no coincidence that the closest star next to us is a red dwarf. And it just so happens that um, out of all of the Earth-like planets that we've discovered that, are, that we find promising um, for hosting life, the vast majority of them are found around red dwarfs. And the prime example of that is Trappist-1, where there are seven planets. Many of them are within the habitable zone of that planet. And so understanding what happens for planets near red dwarfs is incredibly important. But we have a problem. Um, red dwarfs, they are quite a bit uh, angrier than, than the sun. So this is showing, so that's a red dwarf flaring. And this is the sun flaring. And let me just show, show, show the video again. So this is the largest radio flare that has been observed in, well, since we have satellites in space that observe the sun. So. You know, I'm just going to go back and go for it. And again, so it actually shows the sun flaring first. Um, you know, that's where it happened. And then it shows this tiny, youngish red dwarf flaring. Um, the energy release is uh, m many thousand times that of the sun. And, you know, not, not a good situation. And we know that flares are accompanied by really, really energetic particles. So the theory goes, well, maybe these red dwarfs are really good at throwing particles at planets around them. And we, they also do some, weird, uh, some other weird things. Um, red dwarfs are known to host much stronger magnetic fields than the sun. And it actually uh, recently have been observed to have radiation belts where lots of particles get trapped um, in their magnetic field and just keep spiraling and accelerate it to really, really high energy. And this is an artist's impression. That's the actual image um, from radio observations where you see um, the two blobs of the two, the two edges of um, the belt. 
And so you would expect that since red dwarfs are so good at producing flares and they're so good at accelerating particles, you'd be seeing chronal mass ejections around them all the time. And so how do we do that? Well, the answer is with radio telescopes. And let me explain. So I work with this radio telescope. Um, that's what it looks like. Um, it has about 352 of these tiny antennas in, uh, the va in, in Owens Valley in Northern California. And we observe in radio wavelength and in particular in uh, meters wavelength. So um, visible, so, so this is a spectrum of light um, going from visible light all the way down to radio waves. And we sort of observe between FM radio and AM radio. If people still know what AM radio means, but it's radio. <laughs> And so it turns out that one of the best indicators of um, uh, solar coronal mass ejection is what we call a type two solar radial bursts. And this is data from, 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 from our telescope where on the X axis you have time, the horizontal axis you have time, on the vertical axis you have frequency. And this is the signal coming from the sun. It takes a little bit of explanation, but basically it started out at higher frequency, higher pitch, and it ends up at lower frequency, lower pitch. It's like a chirp. And what this actually, so, and this is really, really bright. And we can tell that it's coming from energetic plasma and the sun's atmosphere. And actually, what we can tell from the frequency is where it originates. So when the frequency is really high, um, it means that it comes closer to the sun because things are denser, and therefore the frequency of the plasma radiating is higher. And as it propagates outward, the shock front of, of the coronal mass ejection. It goes through a lower density area further away, and the radiation um, goes to a lower frequency. And I like to think of this as, uh, I don't know, have you all tried to buy watermelons and trying to figure out if it's ripping by, by just tapping on it? If it's a higher pitch, it's probably not ripe yet. If it's a lower pitch, it's probably ready. It's kind of like this, where the pitch or the frequency of the signal that you're seeing is telling you something about the plasma environment. And in this case, the downward drift is telling you how fast this blob is traveling, and it's telling you things about um, its environment and the star's atmosphere. And these are incredibly bright, so we expect to you know, see things like this all the time with red dwarfs. And people have looked. But you end up with things that look anything but, you know, type two that's indicative of chronal mass ejection. So it's the, same, it's, it's the same graphs here where on the horizontal axis you have time, vertical axis frequency, but instead of the downward drift that you see in, 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 in the solar type two, you're seeing just all types of random things that you know, we don't quite know how to interpret yet. And there was actually also an observation of Proxima Centauri um, our clo uh, the closest by star to us and this is the closest thing we get but there are two things that's telling us that it's not a type 2 um, radio burst yet first it actually drifts up before it drifts down and second it lasts too long that's too slow of a blob moving outward um, for it to be leaving the star's atmosphere so the hopes were high. Lots of effort has been done, um, but we don't see anything. Uh, so what's going on? Well, this is where it gets messy because we don't know. So one possibility um, is that, as I said before, red dwarfs has a really strong magnetic field. And so maybe instead of the blob of material leaving um, the star when it gets accelerated by a flare, you act, they actually get trapped in the strong magnetic field of the star and don't get launched at all. So maybe living around a red dwarf is not that bad of an idea. Maybe. Here's another possibility. Um, because the planets of red dwarfs are so close to them, and, the fact, and, and people have seen radio signals from red dwarfs that can be best explained by something that's inducing a current around them, just like a bike dynamo where you pedal on the bike and it creates a current that powers a light. Um, I'm really into uh, outdated references tonight, but um, 
as the star, as a planet rotates around the star, it actually generates a current, and that might be the 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 main mode of interactions between a star and its planet if it's a red dwarf. We have seen some signals of it. It still need a lot more confirmation, but um, you know, in addition to the previous hypothesis that the strong fields contained the eruptions, maybe we just don't understand how planets interact with red dwarfs. And to make it even messier, I did say before that um, particles are bad because they, you know, make DNA, DNA replication unreliable, they make chemistry um, go to unexpected places. But life is a bit of an accident as well, and you need a bit of accident in order to turn, um, you know, simple building blocks of the universe into life. And there has been simulations and some lab studies that show that with the, with the extreme um, radiation environment around red dwarfs, maybe they're conducive to um, chemistry that gives you the building blocks of life. And maybe as red dwarfs age, they will come down and then you end up with planets with lives on them, they're happy. But, you know, we, we, don't, we don't know yet. And one last piece of this is, is, is magnetic field because we've been focusing on what stars do to planet, but planets they, may, they, they can defend themselves as well. And I think the conventional wisdom is that when there is, uh, uh, when there's something like a coronal mass ejection that's hurling a whole lot of um, uh, energetic particles at a planet, having a magnetic field like Earth protects it. And on the left side here is an impression of what happens to, to, to Mars, where the particles tend to penetrate deeper and um, takes away atmosphere along with it. But I did tell you before that we do see aurora and the poles of Earth, and that's because particles are getting redirected into the Earth's atmosphere. And some people think that it might be happening to planets with magnetic fields as well, like Mars. Mars does have a magnetic field, it's just weaker and a bit more disorganized. And so Sean here is a, 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 a diagram of what might be happening. So in blue, you have Mars's tiny little magnetic field. Um, in yellow, you have the solar magnetic field. They're going in different directions. They might reconnect and reconfigure into something new. Um, in red that actually connects Mars's atmosphere to the solar wind and just drags the atmosphere along with it and thereby accelerating atmospheric loss. So the jury is still out on whether or not a magnetic field helps and what kind of magnetic, magnetic field helps in what conditions. So, so, so if there's one takeaway for today, there's a lot we don't know. And the best we can do, well, the best I think we can do is to just keep looking, and that's why we built telescopes. So, the telescope I was talking about before, um, the Owens Valley Radio Observatory Long Wavelength Array, funded by the National Science Foundation, is currently staring at the sky and looking for um, space weather events from stars and planets. Uh, we just went through our last stage of expansion, and things are almost ready to go. We just started collecting nighttime data a few days ago, and you know we're looking. And with that's what we're doing. And with that, I'll take questions. Who has a question? I'll get to you next, but right now, you're easy. Thank you. That was an excellent talk. I really enjoyed it. My question is, you mentioned the magnetic fields of Mars, how they might recombine. Have we tried measuring that? I mean, I know there are a lot of orbiters and then the rovers on there. Is that difficult to measure? And have we found anything out about it? Yeah, and there, 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 there are still more. There are still more um, orbiters and rovers being sent to Mars. 
So here's what I think we have measured. We have seen magnetic reconnection, but we have not seen atmospheric loss accelerating in connection to a magnetic reconnection. <laughs> so that's sort of where things are at. So yeah. Running. Actually, thank you for the lecture. Two, two quick questions. First of all, what's that big spot uh, on the screen right there? Okay. Uh, so, so you mentioned earlier that the dwarf stars are younger stars. Is, is that correct? Okay. Uh, I was just wondering if they would grow in size as they age and perhaps swallow up other planets around them. Sorry, I just want to and, and, and expand up to just about the Earth's orbit and swallows Earth. Um, the thing about, and but for red dwarfs, which are quite a bit unlike the sun, they actually take a very, very, very long time to age. And, so, and when they do enter into the, the last stages of their lives, they do not expand. So that makes it a plus for them if you're, if you're, if you if you want a plant to be around them for a very very long time. So, Centauri. Uh, well, Alpha Centauri is a red dwarf, so it will not expand. Um, for the sun, I think it's like yeah, five billion years for the sun. So. I just wanted to clarify that Proxima Centauri is a red dwarf, but Alpha Centauri is a, sun like the, a star like the sun, isn't it? Well, no, right, right, but Proxima Centauri is a red dwarf, and Alpha Centauri is the brightest. Vi yes, but they're sun, but they're sun-like stars. Yes, I'm. I'm yeah, yes. Okay, sorry. <laughs> All right, so our near, nearest star to us, Alpha Centauri, is actually a triple system composed of three separate stars. And Alpha Centauri, if you look at it in the sky, is really a close binary. And then Proxima Centauri, the one that's actually the closest to us, is a red dwarf, like Yuping was discussing here. But the two stars in the binary of Alpha Centauri that are a little bit more separated are main sequence stars, which means they're more like the sun. They're more on that scale. We're good? OK. Um, can I have you pass it to the young gentleman behind you, please? So earlier you mentioned that Mars' atmosphere was like taken away. Like, does that mean that it still has it? All right, but okay, then my question is, <coughs> what happens if all it get takes, what happens if all the atmosphere gets taken away? Is anything gonna happen? Like mass reduction? Great question, great, great question. It, the, the atmosphere, well, I don't want to steal your show. No, but. <laughs> I mean, the atmosphere is Yeah, I mean, Mars has very little of it left. And, and, you know, Mars is rocky, its atmosphere is not that heavy, you know, it's gas. So, it, you know, it, if it's gone, it will reduce the mass, but I don't think, think that at this point it would do anything that is too different sorry it wouldn't do anything to to make it too different from 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 um what we see today but you know if you take the entire atmosphere of earth away it would probably look a little bit more like mars um so yeah that's 
my answer. And we'll take one more question right now, but don't worry for the people who still have questions. We'll immediately after this question transition into our Q&A panel, um, which compo is composed of uh, our speaker, Yuping, myself, and two other members of the astronomy department here to answer questions. So we can, we can keep taking the hits. The hits can keep rolling. But for right now, uh, Uh, yeah, so earlier when you were um, like explaining why there isn't that much like a, like a type 2 solar flare from a red dwarf, you mentioned that it's, it might be caused by the magnetic field of the star itself. And in that slide, you kind of show a star with like very symmetrical uh, magnetic field and say it's kind of acting like a particle accelerator. Uh, yeah, yeah, but more specifically, um, there's a one before that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, and also in that picture, the star is kind of have like a like a Jupiter sort of atmosphere pattern. So, can you just talk more about like this effect in general? Um, yes. Uh, so, Jupiter does have radiation effects as well. And and yeah, this 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 very orderly magnetic field pattern, which I think was what you're referring to. Um, well, it, it's what you would expect when, so, okay, let me step back. Red dwarfs have, have somewhat messy magnetic fields as well. It's just that for some, um, the orderly part that looks like a bar magnet is so strong that that's what drives lots of physical processes on them. The sun also has something like that, but then it, it's weaker relative to the messy parts of it. And so, um, and for Earth and for Jupiter, you do expect the strongest bit of the magnetic field to look very orderly like that or a bar magnet. Is that your question? Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that, sorry, go ahead. For, yeah, okay. Um, so the question was that, um, the, uh, th this red dwarf shown here has a very older magnetic field that, that looks like what you have for Jupiter. And if the, if the red dwarf is losing mass, then do we expect um, ma mass to be trapped inside its magnetic field? And the answer is a yes, we think. And that's sort of where the radiation belt comes from because um, they keep spiraling around the, the, the star and keeps getting accelerated. I mean, eventually, if, if they get accelerated enough, they escape, but there's a substantial amount probably that, that, that's trapped around the star. Okay, so let's thank our speaker, Yuping Huang. I just checked outside, it's totally clouded over. So sadly, we won't be able to use the telescopes this evening. However, if you wanna stick around for the next hour or so, um, we're going to handle more questions from the audience, both on the topic and the content of the presentation, but just general questions about physics, astronomy, and astrophysics and space science, if you have them, um, by uh, Yuping, myself, and two other members of the department. So it, uh, we'll have a brief intermission as we get set up for that. If you don't wanna stick around, then you don't feel like you have to stick around, uh, but if you wanna stick around, you're free to come and go as you see fit. And uh, we'll get started with the Q&A panel in just a few moments. Um, and again, just as a reminder to everyone, our next one of these is in three weeks from tonight on the topic of black holes. And then our next Astronomy on Tap is two and a half weeks from tonight, Monday, March 4th, at, uh, at the Doghouse in Old Town, Pasadena, on the topics of astrophysical dust and, uh, and Starshot, Project Starshot. Okay, thanks everybody for coming. We'll get started with the Q&A in a moment.
All right, guys. Thanks, everybody, for sticking around for the Q&A portion of the evening. Can I get everybody to quiet down a little bit, please? Turn it up just a hair. Okay, so... Uh, so thanks for sticking around for the Q&A. Um, essentially, before we start taking questions, there's actually a bunch of questions on our YouTube audience that we'll get to as well. Um, I'm just going to have everyone on our panel go through and do a very brief introduction so you know what we are and what science we really know. But feel free to ask questions outside of our areas of expertise. We'll do, you know, we're four people. We know some stuff. We'll try and do what we can to, to put together some responses. Um, so for reference, I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. I'm a research scientist here. I primarily study galaxies and their formation and their evolution. I do that through means of computer simulations. So when we look up in the night sky and we see galaxies evolving, the timescales over which they change are very, very long. It takes like hundreds of millions of years for galaxies to change substantially. So we haven't really been seeing them change a lot in the hundred or so years that we've known about galaxies. And uh, so we rely on computer simulations where we can artificially speed up time in the simulation to see how a galaxy might change over, over billions or, or billions of years since the, since the birth of the universe. So that's primarily the sort of stuff and some cosmology and some star formation, but mostly galaxy stuff. Hi, I'm, I'm Yuping Huang. I'm, I was a speaker. I am a radio astronomer and I work with stars and planets. Hi, I'm Max Goldberg. Um, I'm a fifth year PhD student here at Caltech, hopefully soon to be doctor. Um, I study planets, uh, how planets form, how they evolve, um, how their orbits work. Um, so planets in the solar system, planets outside of the solar system, we now know of over 5,000 planets that orbit around other stars. Um, and so I'm, I mostly, like Dr. Hummels, I mostly use computer simulations to figure out how, um, how planets form. Uh, so we run simulations, uh, see whether we get a bunch of planetary systems that look like the ones that we can actually observe with, with telescopes. And uh, I have a broken wrist, if anyone, if you're one, people are always wondering, I fell off my bike. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, I'm Sam Rose. I'm a second year grad student here in the department. I work primarily in time domain astronomy. Um, I'm mostly interested in optical, so things you see with your eyes and infrared, so just a little bit redder than that, uh, transients that we see in the night sky. My primary instrument of use is the Zwicky Transient Facility on Palomar Mountain, which is just a little bit uh, inland from San Diego. Um, I'm mostly interested in supernova explosions, so what ZTF does is it takes a picture of the sky every two nights. It compares that picture to a picture that it has stored in its memory, what the sky looked like before, and it looks for anything that's new. Um, and some of those new things are exploding stars. Um, so I'm really interested in the physics of exploding stars, how uh, black holes um, and neutron stars are formed in those explosions, um, and sort of the other byproducts of these explosions, including interstellar uh, uh, dust, which then goes on to influence galaxy evolution and star formation, and just sort of get a sense of that cycle. Um, is something that's really interesting to me. Great. Okay. So, thank you. So now we're happy to take questions from all of you or also the online YouTube audience. So I'll get a question from here and then you had your hand up first in the back, so I'll get to you. It's my, my daily steps here running around. Hi guys. Uh, I'm not very scientifically inclined, so I apologize if I butcher the question. Um, I'm like vaguely familiar with the idea of a Dyson sphere, um, some uh, some device that can capture the energy from a from a star. So my question for you, Ping, is like, how? I'd love for you to just just speak on it, uh, but also just like, how does the violent nature, more violent nature of the, or relatively more violent nature of the red dwarf uh, ejections, uh, make it? Does it make it a better candidate for a Dyson sphere capture? uh as compared to like a main sequence sun like star or is it like so unstable it's like evil and like just destroy it i don't know anyway that's my question well i like this inventive creative questions involving science fiction <laughs> sounds good wait what dyson spheres are not real okay not okay fine um no um 
I actually, I don't know. I think a Dyson sphere is a thing that you build around a star that harvests light and turn it into electricity or something like that, right? Okay. Um, I mean, so so if it's light that you're after, you know, red dwarfs are dimmer, and so maybe there's less light going out of it. So that's the first thing. Um, I mean, if you're trying to harvest the energy of the particles that's coming out, that might be a good candidate. However, that is a piece of electronics, and electronics do not do well when you know there's you know when there's energetic particles streaming at them but if you i think if you if you build it well enough it should work <laughs> yeah. last words. um there was a question from online is there any indication that mars in the past had an atmosphere as dense as what we have on the earth prior to it being stripped off by like a lack of magnetic fields or anything like that i honestly don't know do you guys I'll, tr I'll try not to speculate too much, um, but yeah, Mars has remnants of a magnetic field, um, which suggests that it used to have a more significant magnetic field that went away. Um, yeah, so the, the idea is that if you're losing, if Mars is losing its atmosphere now, if you roll back the clock, then maybe it had a really big atmosphere. Um, there is pretty good evidence that Mars used to have a lot of water. Um, it doesn't anymore. Mars has a little bit of water now, but not much. Um, so I think Putting all those pieces together, Mars probably had a thicker, denser atmosphere, but we don't really know exactly. Okay, back to the in-person audience. Okay, I'll go with you here. But I've got you in my sights. Yeah, this question is for Max. Um, exoplanets, we, at the doghouse, there is the professor, uh, that Dr. Luke, or, yeah, it was saying that there's gonna be a new mission and the way you find out more um, find more exoplanets is by occultation of one star over another. Now, here's the question. The apparent motion is such, so slow due to our distance from it that previously I thought we just used parallax, right? So we, the Earth comes over here, we take picture. The other end, we take another picture and then we use parallax to find out. How can we do that with, you know what I'm saying? They, they move so slow, apparently, how can you track it across? And it's dragging a planet, just like Dr. Luke said, right? It's dragging a planet across another star, and then you measure the fluctuations in, in light how, as it happens in real time. So I think the question is, so this is related to a presentation that was given on Monday night um, at our Astronomy on Tap. When stars pass in front of each other, if you have a binary star system, you have two stars that are orbiting around each other, and one will pass in front of the other star. And if that one of those stars hosts a planet as well, you'll see a brightening and then a dip in the, in the overall brightness from the background star, indicating the presence of the planet. And your question is, how do you observe this in real time? Multiple star system then, like a binary or in the Alpha Centauri system, there's three. So as they go around each other, then we're talking like 11 years. So then you can observe it. Thank you. You answered my question. In inadvertent solutions. I like this. I like this. Yeah, just to add, like, um, for most of the exoplanet discoveries via this method, they, the planet passes in front of the star usually in a couple hours. That's a typical time scale. Um, so we see a dimming of the star for a few hours, and then it gets back to its normal brightness. Um, so that's how long it takes. But then there's a, the gap between those is however long it takes for the planet to go around its star. And uh, that could be very, very long. It's less likely that we would be able to see that, but it could be 10 years or whatever, um, just depending on the setup. But the same thing happens with stars or planets. So one star can block the light from another star as well. Thank you for your clarification. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about like the uh, computer systems, like to simulate like galaxy formation and like stars. Uh, so I was, uh, like you said, uh, like we've only like known about them for like a hundred years, which is like a very small fraction of time on like how much time it takes to like make major changes. So how do you like use the information gathered within like a hundred years to simulate something that could happen within like over like hundred million years? 
Excellent, excellent uh, introspective question. Uh, the, the main thing that we're doing is oftentimes when we're simulating galaxies, we're not trying to simulate specific galaxies. Of course, once in a while, we'll try and simulate the Milky Way and how it's changing or the Andromeda galaxy and our relationship to it. But usually when we're simulating these systems, we're simulating a, a generic galaxy. Uh, that doesn't actually have a direct counterpart in the universe. Kind of like if you were trying to understand a human life, you wouldn't go out and select, you know, Max, for instance. You might go out and just draw a, a generic human and follow its evolutionary stages through its life and then compare the results of that kind of against the general population of people composed of you and Max and you Ping and Sam and myself and so on and so forth. So for galaxy evolution, we're, we start out with our starting point, our initial conditions are kind of a representative chunk of space, and we form a representative kind of generic galaxy within that. And we do this multiple times, forming different galaxies that might be this part of the population, like uh, really tall people, and this part of the population, really short people, or people with red hair, or something like that. And each, each individual simulation is going to be a distinct iteration of that, but but overall, we hope that we can do this enough times to get the general trend of how things tend to evolve or form or that sort of thing. Yeah, counterpart question. Kind of like a follow-up question. How do you get the information to do that? Like, how, how do you like get inf uh, galac like information from galaxies from with like different, I don't like yeah. aspects that, that can like simulate them? So the, the things that kind of designate how a galaxy is going to a form are the, the initial conditions, the distribution of matter that goes into it. Um, and we have a rough idea of what the distribution of material in the early universe was from something called the cosmic microwave background, which is this echo, people refer to it as like the echo of the Big Bang. It's the, it's it's the light that's coming towards us that's residual from the initial explosion of the Big Bang. And if you look at the distribution of that light, it can tell you something about the distribution of matter in the early universe. So you put that into your simulation, you program in the physics uh, that governs these scales like gravity and hydrodynamics, and then you run it forward to, to today. And depending on if I focus on, on my simulation on this chunk of space, it might form something that looks like the Milky Way. But if I focus on this chunk of space that has a different distribution of matter, it might form something more like the Andromeda galaxy or something like M81 or one of these other different types of galaxies. So really it's up to the stuff that was there and how it's interacted with its environment since that time in terms of running into other galaxies or colliding or 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 evolving in isolation it'll have a different kind of life path for that galaxy so that's that's how we how you end up with different types of galaxies yep uh question in the back i'll get to you in a second Sergio. hello Oh, she has one as well. Okay, I'll get to her too. Hi, um, my question is uh, with the advancements in uh, telescopes and technology, observation technology, are we headed towards a, uh, the ability to directly observe planets around other stars, not just the sort of traversing, but could we ever build a telescope big enough uh, or strong enough to image it in, in the visible light spectrum, I guess. Great. And it turns out we, we have, kind of, but I'll let you. Yeah, as Cameron just hinted, um, we, we can do this, kind of. Um, so the vast majority of planets that have been discovered have been discovered indirectly via this like shadow of a planet passing from the star or via the wobble of a star. Um, but a small fraction of them have been discovered directly by just imaging them, um, about 10. So of the maybe 5,000 planets that have been discovered, about 10 have been actually directly imaged. Um, the number actually has gone down a few times. Um, things that we thought were images of planets were actually stars in the background um, is unfortunate. But uh, the reason why it's so hard to do it is because it's not because the planets are, are necessarily so faint. The problem is that the stars are really bright. So you have a very, very small, faint thing next to a really, really bright 
um, object. So the, the common analogy is you're looking for a firefly right next to a spotlight. So it's not that hard to see the firefly. The problem is the glare from the spotlight. So uh, actually, there's a lot of work trying to do better at this. Um, actually, at Caltech, there's people on this floor are building new instruments uh, that get installed in Hawaii to try to do better observations of this. So this is a really, really active area of research. Um, it will be very different in 10 or 20 years. We'll have much better instruments for doing this. Um, right now, we can directly take pictures of planets if they're far enough from the star and if the planets are hot enough and big enough so that they're kind of bright. But if we're trying to take an image of a planet like Earth, um, we're decades away from being able to do that. So, the young audience member here. My mom goes to my little. What? My a mom. Question about the moon. The moon goes up and higher and higher and higher and higher. No. <laughs> You want to ask them your question about the moon, about why it's sometimes full and when sometimes a sliver? Moon, moon, pizza moon. <laughs> um, she wants to know why the moon. Why is the moon sometimes full and sometimes a sliver or a crescent? Who wants to do lunar phases? Do we have a, I'm trying to think if I've got a bright enough light bulb that we can pull this off and do it. This could work. Okay, I have a microphone. Maybe the microphone can be the earth. Okay, so my water bottle is the sun. My black marker is gonna be the earth. So I rotate around over the course of a year. I go around the sun over the course of a month or a moon. We see our, ooh, let's see, maybe I need a third. <laughs> All right, let's see. Okay, so we got the Earth, we've got the Moon. So all, hi. Okay, so all the light that we see from the Moon isn't actually from the Moon itself. It's sunlight that's being reflected off the Moon. So here I am on this side of Earth. During a full Moon, the Moon is over here. So when I look, the whole surface of the Moon that I can see from Earth is illuminated by the sunlight coming from my water bottle. And then for a new moon, instead, it's over here. It's during the day. So you might have noticed sometimes you see the moon during the day instead of during at night. That means the moon is somewhere over here instead, where only parts of it's being lit up. The moon is like a little tent. A little tent? Tent moon. Like a sliver? Or like a, like it's sort of like a crescent or something like that. <laughs> that's that's a little bit better, I think, than this. But yeah, so when we have a crescent moon, that means just a part of the moon that we see from Earth. So maybe like this part. So you only see this tiny crescent. I have some little, 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 little games, and they're very, very small. <laughs> that, that was a good explanation. Thank you, Sam, and thank you. I'll bring down a, a model and an illumination that'll be a little bit more palpable in terms of the description. Um, but for now, uh, there's actually, I wanted to get to a couple of the questions online. One question was about radio telescopes. Are there any benefits to having a radio telescope in orbit, like low Earth orbit, above having a radio telescope on the surface of the Earth? Um, yes. Um, there, there are lots of advantages to having telescopes in space in general. Big, part of it is because the atmosphere distorts light and radio waves, and that just makes life really difficult on Earth um, doing astronomy in general. And therefore, if you any instrument that you can put on Earth, um, I think I would prefer it being in space if it weren't so expensive. 
So, but, 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 but to be serious, there are radio telescopes or single dishes that are <clears throat> orbiting in space. And typically what you do is link them up with dishes on Earth and then use them together. And I think that there is also one dish on the moon, but I don't think that people have tried to do imaging with it, with stuff on Earth. More questions? I have a question for Sam. Uh, can you tell me, tell us more about the supernova you observed? And like, how, is it uh, what's the, the, the latest and or the, I mean, what kind of things you observed so far? Thank you. Yeah, so the benefit of a big survey telescope like ZTF, which sees the whole northern skies every two nights, is that we find a lot of stuff all the time. Um, so every week there's someone who goes through and scans the alerts and sees what's sort of interesting to look at. That happens to be me this week. So we've had a couple of bad days due to weather, um, but just about every, every night or so we get about 100 alerts. Um, of those, not all are actually supernova, a lot are um, from the active galactic nuclei, so black holes at the centers of galaxies also show a lot of variability. Um, so these show up as differences in our nightly picture of the sky, so we see those. Um, sometimes we see things like novae, which are uh, much not quite supernova, but are also outbursts. Those are from um, usually white dwarfs um, that just sort of uh, brighten up um, as they accrete from a, a companion. I would say if I had to pick maybe the most interesting supernova, um that we've observed recently that's such a hard question they're all really cool um i will pick supernova 2023 ixf um so it's one of the closest supernova that we've seen in a really really long time it's a fairly typical uh supernova it's a massive star it reached the end of its life um when so stars support themselves against gravity by fusing elements in their cores. Uh, once you fuse up to iron in your core, you actually, <laughs> you actually can't fuse any higher because you don't get any additional energy. So as you may know, like um, hydrogen uh, bombs, they release energy by fusing, um, but like uranium and plutonium, they release energy by fissioning. So by getting less massive, but you can't actually get energy powering a star by doing fission. So, uh, you sort of end up at iron um, with no more uh, any kind of uh, fusion to support your core anymore. Your core collapses and eventually it ends the amount of time that it can collapse due to uh, quantum mechanical effects. It can't collapse anymore. It has a bounce, it launches it outward um, and just pushes out up. But this one is really interesting. It's a fairly like vanilla, normal core collapse supernova, but it was really nearby. So we were able to study it really well. Um, and we haven't had a very new rise supernova since 1987. Um, this one's farther than the one that we observed in 1987, but it's always nice when we have something nearby and we can study really, really well, um, just because they're so much brighter and we can uh, get a lot more information than we are able to normally. So I'll pick, I'll pick supernova 2023 IXF. <laughs> I'm the, uh, is it a light spectrum like do you see different elements do you see different colors or i mean what what's what's the, the typical things you see yeah so supernova are divided into many classes but i would call like three main classes based on the types of elements that you see in their spectra um, so type 2 supernova um, come from just ordinary massive stars they have lots of hydrogen um, in their spectra so hydrogen lines um, which come from like if you see in like a neon light or certain colors, um, hydrogen also emits in specific colors and uh, wavelengths. So you see lots of hydrogen lines in type two supernova. In type one supernova, um, you see no hydrogen lines. Um, so these are coming from stars that have either lost their hydrogen or didn't have any hydrogen to begin with. So these are uh, explosions from white dwarfs and explosions from what are called stripped envelope stars. So their hydrogen envelope has been stripped away um, either through binary interactions or um, through um, just intrinsically throwing off a lot of their mass. Uh, these are further divided into three different subclasses. Type 1a supernova have very strong silicon lines. Um, these are the ones that are coming from the white dwarfs. Um, the stripped envelope supernova are divided into type B and type C. 
depending on whether or not they have helium. So if you sort of draw the structure of a star, <laughs> oh no. You're right. <laughs> All right. Okay, so um stars and their lives, they have some kind of iron core. This is what ends up collapsing. Then it has other elements like carbon, oxygen, anything like sort of between hydrogen and helium. If you go like down the periodic table, um, those things sort of fuse out here. I'm sort of running out of space, so I'll draw my helium. So, so start, they're sometimes called like an onion and then hydrogen. So in our type one, uh, type two supernova, we still have our, from massive stars, so these are stars more than eight times or 10 times the mass of our own sun. Um, we keep the hydrogen envelope, um, so we see lots of strong hydrogen ion lines in the type two supernova spectra. In a type B supernova, part of the envelope has been lost, either through binary reactions where uh, maybe some of the envelope got uh, accreted onto a companion or got blown away by a companion that went supernova earlier, or some stars are massive enough that they are just very like convective and throw off a lot of their outer layers. So now I'm on my type one supernova, right? Now it's no more hydrogen. I don't see any hydrogen lines. Um, so I see helium lines. That means I'm a type one B, uh, B for having helium, because yeah, that makes sense. Um, now say I strip myself even further, I'm still a massive star, right? I still have my iron core, but I've now somehow stripped my helium. Sometimes these are called super stripped or ultra stripped um, just because they even more of their envelopes have been lost. So I have no helium and no hydrogen. So I have no helium and no hydrogen lines. Um, so those are type 1C spectra. The type 1A spectra actually come from a totally different oops, progenitor channel. Instead, they're from um, white dwarfs. So uh, a white dwarf is supported by electron degeneracy pressure, it's getting some kind of mass from a companion, it's accreting onto the white dwarf, eventually too much mass accretes and no longer able to be supported by electron degeneracy pressure, there's sort of a limit there. Um, and uh, the white dwarf is made mostly, usually of carbon and oxygen, um, sometimes uh, helium, and then it gets massive enough that it actually starts fusing again. But because it's so dense, it starts fusing like all at once. Um, like, imagine you like packed a tinderbox full of something extremely flammable, and then you struck it with a match. The thing explodes. Um, and this is where you see a lot of the, you get a lot of the silicon lines and stuff. So these are type 1A supernova. Question, okay, uh, one second. Can you pass this to the gentleman behind you? Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you. This question is for a, well, mainly you, Ping, but anybody, anybody in the panel. A, at first, it could a, seem or sound disappointing uh, to have, you know, say, planets around the uh, red dwarfs that are in inhospitable environments because of the flaring of stars and all that. Uh, we also have a, a the planetary systems around white dwarfs that were already engulfed by the red giant face of the white dwarf. Uh, so these are more like cinder worlds. My question is, uh, is there any sense as to how many, what is the proportion or what fraction of these, let me call them cinder worlds or dead worlds or dead planets, how many of those could have had a favorable conditions for life to have thrived on them in the past right now they are just you know dead whatever but uh, but it's quite exciting actually the possibilities that they could have harbored life so how many of those maybe all of those maybe i mean it's uh, what is what is your sense of that
Yeah. So, so, so let me start by saying that th we, we call red dwarves dwarves. And that's a bit of unfortunate terminology. They, they're very different from white dwarves. And w the, the sun, um, I think some of refer to the sun as a main sequence star, but the sun is also known as an orange dwarf, sorry, a yellow dwarf. So anything but a white dwarf is a normal main sequence star that's you know either young or in their prime ages. And some of the main sequence stars, um, mainly stuff that's bluer than a yellow dwarf, like the sun, or the sun, will continue to expand as they, well, when they reach the end of the light, they expand and it eventually either goes supernova or turn into white dwarfs. That being said, um, there has, there, there's been only, I think there, there, there are very few planets that's been found around white dwarfs. Um, you know, which are which are real, which are stars that have gone through the expansion phase. So I don't think that we have a good sense of how many of them used to be habitable. If anything, the, the, it, it will look kind of like planets around currently current stars in their prime ages. Um, things like things that look like the sun, um, you know, yellow dwarfs and things like that. But I guess we can estimate things like we think based on the exoplanets that have been detected in the universe or in our galaxy, that there's the prediction, correct me if I'm wrong, it's basically we think that each star in the galaxy or in the universe probably has at least a planet, right? That's basically the estimate. And I guess the question then is when you have a main sequence star that turns into a red dwarf and burns its nearby system, nearby planets and then turns into a white dwarf. Red giant. Oh, I'm sorry, did I, did I uh, forgive me, yeah, <laughs> forgive me, sorry guys, slip of the tongue, um, uh, turns into a red giant and then torches its nearby planets and then turns into a white dwarf. Do those planets remain there or are they ejected? And that's a dynamical question, but it seems to me they'd probably stick around in which case. We don't know. This is, this is a, <laughs> This is a major open research question. Actually, there are people in my research group working on this. Um, yeah, so if lots of stars have planets and then the, the star goes through its red giant phase, um, it will, the star will engulf some of the planets, but not all of them. Um, so presumably some of them will stick around. Um, but the thing is that we see, when we look at white dwarfs, we actually see, we don't necessarily see a lot of planets. We haven't found a ton of planets, but we see a lot of uh, rocky material, so more like asteroids, are really common. Um, no one knows uh, where those are from, like whether they were there before the star became a white dwarf, whether they came after. Um, they're all kind of falling into the white dwarf. No one knows why they're doing that either. This is actually like really open research topic. Um, so yeah, but they're, most of them are probably not habitable. Uh, white dwarfs are not, they're very faint stars. Um, and of course, the, the environment that led to the white dwarf was not particularly pleasant for, for the planets. Yeah, Cameron just reminded me that they, have, they emit a lot of uh, ultraviolet light, which is probably not good for, for life on the planets. OK, uh, OK. I'll um, as mentioned, like Mars used to have a stronger atmosphere or magnetic field. Could Earth become like Mars and lose our magnetic field or lose our atmosphere? Or is that a possibility? Yeah, I mean, uh, this is reaching the, the bounds of my knowledge. But I think um, the, the Earth has a magnetic field because of its molten core. Um, if the core stopped being molten, Earth would presumably stop having a magnetic field. Um, and that's maybe what happened to Mars. I'm not an expert on this. Um, once the magnetic field is gone. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> well, I, 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 so Venus doesn't have an active magnetic field, and yet um, its atmosphere somehow 
it's like an extrinsic magnetic field that's created by its atmosphere's reaction, even though it doesn't have a molten core that's causing a dynamo and causing the magnetic field. And obviously, even without that internal magnetic field, Venus has like the thickest atmosphere of all the rocky planets. So it has held on to its its atmosphere. Um, so it's what's that? Not water. Not water, though. Yeah, that's true. So it's a magnetic fields are tricky, a tricky business. Um, and I don't know, presumably, yeah, what Max said is correct. Like if our dynamo stops, then our magnetic field stops and then we lose our atmosphere and lose our water and then it's a bad place for us. But I don't know, Venus is kind of a counterpoint. So not that it's pleasant to be on Venus because it's like super dense, uh, super high pressure and a thousand degrees and all of these problems, but. Okay, uh, there was a question in the back that I keep promising to get to. Thank you. So um, I guess just in all four of your respective fields, what is some kind of basic or uh, obvious phenomenon that we still don't understand? Ooh. Magic in everyday life. Um. Why does Earth have a magnetic field? <laughs> Uh, I I need to think of. Does anybody else come into this? Okay, yeah, if you're ready. How do stars work? You we you should we have an understanding of stellar physics, but a lot of it, especially when you come to like supernova explosions and these kinds of things, where we've been working on it a long time, you sort of think we should know how these things go. Uh, we really don't have a super deep understanding. We don't know whether any given star will form a black hole or a neutron star, whether it will explode or implode, um, which seems a very like straightforward question, right? You should be able to, from a star, be able to say, okay, are you going to explode? Are you going to implode? Some of them implode, some of them explode. We don't know why. Um, we know we have some idea of why perhaps there's something in their cores they're more dense um, and then that causes them to implode some of them have like less dense cores to begin with and that causes them to explode but there really isn't as deep an understanding as as you may think there should be um, and sort of is presented in freshman astro classes like if you're above 25 solar masses you'll always become a black hole or if you're you know below 25 solar masses, you always become a neutron star. That boundary is much, much um, fuzzier in reality. Uh, one in planets is why is Jupiter the mass that it is? Um, so it's kind of a stupid question, like why is Jupiter Jupiter mass? Uh, but the thing is that when, when planets get really, really big, like Jupiter, um, they grow very, very fast. They become really efficient at sort of sucking up all the material around them. Um, and so they actually grow like exponentially fast, but then uh, seemingly Jupiter just stopped growing. Like there's no reason why it couldn't have just been twice the mass that it is or, or 10 times more. Um, and we just don't really have any idea of why it stopped growing. Like presumably it ran out of material um, to, to accrete, to gain onto its, into its atmosphere, but we don't actually know why that happened. You wanna add anything else? Yeah, I feel like people explain why 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 their question is a question, so maybe I should. Um, so it, it's not entirely obvious that you know if you have a molten core, then you end up with a constantly churning interior that gives you a magnetic field. And in fact, we think that Mars does have a molten core. Um, if you have a molten core, you know it's like all liquid, but everything is settled down where the heaviest stuff is in the center, but the less heavy stuff is out there it doesn't necessarily you know churns it just settles and that doesn't give you a magnetic field and so there are theories that says that maybe it was a giant um as asteroid a giant impact from the asteroid or something a minor object um an asteroid that that sort of uh, disturbed equilibrium that used to be Earth and that got the process started. But we don't know and we don't have enough planets around to tell us what would give rise to a steady self-generating magnetic field. Um, I'll, I'll 
suggest two answers to your question. One is a tie in to what Sam was talking about that we don't really well understand understand the evolution of stars and the processes in them. I mean, we we there are stellar scientists who spend their entire careers doing this, but that's that I'm not trying to put those people down, but we don't have like a perfect understanding. And furthermore, our sun, our sun, there's a lot of behavior on the sun that we have some idea of how it's behaving, but the magnetic fields associated with the sun are super, super, super complicated. It's not like the earth where it's roughly just like a bar magnet, um, like a north and a south pole. The sun has all kinds of crazy stuff and you've got sunspots and you've got the features that, that uh, Yu Ping showed during his talk of these outflows and flares and coronal mass ejections, and it's very, very complicated. And so, for instance, there's a mission right now called the Solar Parker Probe that's trying to better understand that the, the atmosphere around the sun by taking samples at different locations. But right now, the, the atmosphere of the sun is, is much, much hotter than the sun itself. Like the solar surface is a few thousand degrees. But the corona, and it has nothing to do with coronavirus, corona just means crown. So it's the, the region around, around the sun that extends all the way, in some ways, out to us. That solar atmosphere is like a million degrees. So why, it's not well understood why that, that corona, that atmosphere is so, so much hotter than the surface of the sun. And that's one of these things that this mission is trying to understand, which you'd think, you know, we've known about the sun for a long time now. And yet we still don't have a really good understanding of, of its long term behavior. Um, and the other thing that I'll just add to that on a totally different take is dark matter. Dark matter is something that astrophysicists basically invoke willy nilly to to explain the dynamics of very large systems like galaxies or clusters of galaxies. And without it in our models, galaxies don't work correctly. You, they'll fly apart because they have so much rotation or angular momentum and they don't have enough mass to hold them together to counteract that rotation. And so we invoke this idea of dark matter all the time, this unseen matter that has to be in our models in order for things to behave correctly, but it doesn't, we can't see it. We can't take a picture of it. We can't detect it in anything directly through visible light or light with x-rays or light with radio waves or light with any part of the electromagnetic spectrum and so that is something that i think is a very basic thing that we should and are trying to understand i mean it's the the major mass component to the entire universe it it dwarfs the amount of stuff in protons and electrons and and so-called baryonic matter the stuff that makes up us the normal matter this dark matter is a much larger constituent of the universe and yet we don't know what it is so i think that that for me, at least in my research, is the biggest kind of elephant in the room is like, we, we think we should understand this, but we, we don't yet understand this. So it's, yeah, I always say this, like, if, when people ask, what is dark matter? I'm like, if we had the answer, then we'd have a Nobel Prize, because like, that's one of the big, big questions in, in the field of astrophysics that we don't yet understand. Okay. Uh, I'm going to take a question from our YouTube audience because I don't want them to feel like I've been ignoring them. And they have some wonderful questions here. Uh, the question is, there was a question about Miyake events. Have people heard of that? I had to look it up because I'd never heard of it. Um, these are, someone asked if Miyake events were more powerful than the Carrington event, the event you were describing in your presentation, this 1859 solar uh, activity. I guess a Miyake event, there have been five that have been found through dendrochronology of tree rings and such that indicate some massive cosmic ray flux from other, presumably some other distant, distinct objects like stars, nearby stars, or maybe uh, AGN or something like that. But I don't know, so I, I don't think anyone on our panel can necessarily, oh, you can, t okay, you can talk about these events. Yeah, that's sort of why, well, I, I don't know the specifics of Miyagi events, but I, I hesitate when I, when I said that the Carrington event was the most energetic solar events that we observed because there has since been studies of true rings where they um, found out that in certain, I think like, yeah, something like that. Thousands of years ago, um, you you certainly got a whole lot of um, all, well, you, you got a whole lot of um, protons and neutrons, probably from the sun. And there were also archaeology records of people seeing aurora, um, and and in, in very far away from from the poles that coincided with some of those 
records. So I think those might have been even more energetic than the Carrington band. There was another question about why are red dwarfs angrier than our own sun? Why do they have these more energetic flares and coronal mass ejections and such? What's the physics of why that is? Short answer is that they have a stronger magnetic field. Okay. Yeah, and the reason why they have a stronger magnetic field I know. Um let's say okay, they 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 are smaller, they are cooler. So then the 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 the, the inside the, the inside of the star is much hotter than the outside of the star and that he has got to go out somewhere somehow and so how mass so so then how massive how big a star is impacts how the energy gets outside for something like the sun um it turns out that a lot of energy escapes without stirring up a lot of materials inside the star whereas in uh, a red dwarf it just so turns out that as the 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 energy gets out primarily by pushing materials outward and that's a whole lot of bubbling and that gives you the churning motion that we were talking about before that gives you a strong self-sustaining magnetic field that's the best i can do okay i'll add one more dimension to this that hasn't been mentioned um so stars age over time like everything um as stars age they become less active so young stars are really really active older stars are less active uh, red dwarfs age very slowly so they have a so actually there are no red there are no old red dwarfs because the universe is just not old enough yet um, so they will eventually age but they just haven't yet um, so we, we we don't like the ones that exist now are still kind of all young but the sun for example is not young but when the sun was young young it was very active as well sure okay so if you've ever boiled water on the stove you've seen, you know, things start to bubble up, right? Um, your stove top is very hot, the air above it is cold relative to that. Um, things start to churn around and you get these like bubbles that pulse up and you can sort of see even with the stove, right? Things are sort of come up and get pushed away. Um, and that's sort of what I've tried to illustrate here. It's extremely poorly. <laughs> So you sort of have what are called like convective cells. So if I maybe just look at one of these cells, like I have some like colder thing, which is it went to the surface, it's cooled off, it's falling down, it comes back down here, it's being heated up by fusion, um, and then it's pushed back up again. And you get sort of these, all these uh, convective cells, um, which just are churning and bringing material up and, and just like a pot bubbling on the stove, things start to come up, um, maybe like, Frying stuff in oil is the better example. Things are sort of like, you know. Miso soup example. This is very exciting. So, so if you've ever ordered miso soup at a at a Japanese restaurant, and if it's still hot, you continue to see the particulate in the miso that's that's going through this convection, through this kind of churning as it heats up and 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 then reaches the surface, cools off and falls back down, and you get that same kind of effect. And that's the that's called convection, and we see that in a variety of different environments, including the interiors of certain types of stars, including the sun. The outer layer of the sun does this convection which is largely attributed with a lot of the magnetic activity that we have in it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So that's right. You you get this rotation, it can drag magnetic field lines along with it, and it can start to build up the strength of a magnetic field. That's right. That's right. We actually have convection cells on Earth. So um, if, you, if you look at a map of the Earth, you can see that actually a lot of um, deserts are at the same latitudes. They're a little bit, 
I think 30 degrees, 20 degrees for the Hadley cells. I don't actually know. Like the, yeah, yeah. So like 20, 30 degrees uh, north and south of the equator, you have regions that are very, very dry compared to other places. Um, and this is because there are two like main cells on Earth. So the equator, uh, the sun shines very warm. Um, the ocean is warm. You get pockets of warm, moist air, which come up and then move north and south. Um, and sort of drop their rain off along as you go along. And then finally, when they're coming back down, they're all dried out. Um, so you have, a, you actually can see these um, convective cells are really a big impact of weather on Earth. So the Sahara, I think, is one of these. It's on the, the edge of the Hadley cells. Um, even the, the uh, Death Valley in the US, um, what is the Sonora and the Mojave. <laughs> My geography is much worse than my astronomy. Uh, yeah, Atacama, all of these ones that are like at 20 and 30 um, degrees where you, you lack these um, cells, which are sort of coming down the down part where they've given up a lot of their moisture um, are falling down and a very dry, dry air coming down from above. Um, and then on the equator, you have the very moist cells that are coming up. So convective cells happen everywhere and are important. Yeah, thunderstorms and hurricanes are convective too, and very angry. Okay, additional questions? Yes. Uh, a question on coronal mass ejections. So we can see them when they leave the sun, and we can also see them when they interact with our atmosphere via aurora. Um, can we track them in between, or are we just kind of guessing whether or not a coronal mass ejection is headed our way based on what we see when it just leaves the sun. I think, well, do you know? I think I know, but I don't know. I, I believe, so there's a number of different solar space telescopes that are constantly monitoring the, the sun and, and looking for not just behavior and activity in its proximity, but the tracking the wind as it goes outward. I think we're able to largely follow the evolution of structure into the outer solar system, but I don't know. I, I, maybe I'm mistaken. It wouldn't be through emission because I think it gets too low, low surface density to follow it beyond, you know, a few solar radii, but I don't know. Do you guys know? Maybe I don't know. <laughs> I'm fairly sure that once you get sort of beyond the, the stellar corona that you can't see the effect anymore. So the density of space is really quite low. Um, so the stuff is pretty much fair, free to stream along and not interact with anything. So it would be hard to see. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's like you, you wouldn't, there aren't any observational effects that I can think of a priori. Maybe Yu Ping has a different idea. No. Um, it, plasma emission again oh, um yeah so i don't know if this is dumb per se but it, it's the same kind of um radio burst that we see from the sun that comes from basically our shock front and as it travels out where the density gets lower but that just means it that just means that it just even lower in radio frequency you still have a shock and if the conditions are right you would still get really bright radio emissions so you'd see it in the I mean, we, we do, I mean, at our frequencies, we do see, you know, uh, a CME that's, that's a few solar radii away. That's already far, far enough. And, and to go lower frequency than that, you need to go to space. Um, I don't know if there is a space-based low frequency radio mission, um, but if you were at the talk, our last talk, there was, there, there, there was a proposal to put uh, a large radio telescope on the far side of the moon. And part of the, the scientific goal is to actually detect um, that, that emission very far away from the star um, on, on red dwarf systems. They're really low in frequency, but because of the way the magnetic fields are structures, that might be actually when they start to generate really bright radio emissions. Okay. Additional questions from the in-person audience? Yes. Thank you, this has been fascinating. Uh, 
a question on, could I ask two quick? Sure. Perfect. Um, so the first one is on why the corona is hotter than the surface of the sun. Is that a situation perhaps um, similar to what's going on with the red dwarf where there's some kind of magnetic field entrapment going on there that's over energizing the particles to create a hotter environment. Um, and the other question is, I had read some time ago that there was an idea uh, on the idea of the magnetic field that the singular moon of the Earth moved the, uh, the core material in such a way that it um, united the rotations in such a way, a rotation of the core in such a way that it created a stronger magnetic field. Is there any agreement on that that, uh, that you all are aware of as, as a motivation for that? Or what, what does that look like? Thank you. Huh. I don't know anything about that. The second, do you? Yeah. So yes, that has been a theory. And as I as I said before, how Earth got its magnetic field is an open question. And I think the moon was one of the theories. Um, and I think that had to do with the date uh, or how old Earth's magnetic field was and that sort of coincided with when the moon formed, but also that coincided with the giant impact event that created the moon. And so it, it was a it has been a bit of a toss up between like was it impact or was it the moon? And that's all that I know about the moon and Earth's magnetic field. Uh, the corona heating problem. Oh, yeah. I saw magnetic re reconnection is kind of connected. Yeah, idea. yeah, so I think you're right. Okay. I, well, so the answer is we don't know, but that's why part of the reason why the Solar Parker probe was launched to better take measurements in the inner corona to hopefully try and disentangle this challenging problem about why is the corona so much hotter than the surface of the sun. Um, but I think the general hypothesis that people generally agree on is that it is some sort of magnetic reconnection events from the surface that's releasing an enormous amount of energy and because the corona is so much lower density it it and it stores stores a, a large amount of energy then it has to be at a very high temperature in order to store that that energy that's being released through these magnetic reconnection events but i don't i don't know it in any more detail than that do you guys have anything to add on that yeah, magnetic fields are, are kind of magical, so they can do lots of cool stuff. Um, okay, uh, I wanted to get to another question from the online audience here, and that was um, the James, a totally different realm of questioning than we've been having just for the last moment. James Webb Space Telescope saw planets without stars in the Orion Nebula, and are these ejected from star systems, or could they have condensed on their own from clouds? I think this is a, this is a good question. Obviously, some people have strong. Yeah, so a little context of so the James Webb Space Telescope just looked um, very deeply at the Orion Nebula, which is a young star forming region nearby. Um, you can see it in a backyard telescope. Um, and it found a lot of really small, like planets planet-like objects, which are presumably also really young, um, that aren't orbiting around stars. So they're just like hanging out by themselves. Um, some of them come in pairs, actually, which is interesting. So we don't know whether they are uh, planets that formed around a star and then were ejected, or if they formed alone. So this is an open question. Um, the two hypotheses are both completely reasonable. So for example, like if you have a planetary system with a bunch of planets, um, they can interact with each other really strongly. They pull on each other with their own gravity and basically kick out one or more of the planets. And we think this may have happened in the solar system. It's possible that we actually had five giant planets uh, early on, and then we lost one of them. And um, so that would explain some things in the solar system, but it would also produce a free-floating planet that's just flying around the galaxy. Um, so this is probably common. Um, it happened in our solar system. Maybe it happened in lots of other ones. And that would generate a, a population of these, these objects. 
Um, but it's also possible that they form more like stars. They're just like miniature stars um, that formed in a cloud. Um, Cameron would know more about whether this is like a reasonable hypothesis. Hard. It's hard to do that. They're, yeah, so they're, they span the range of, of sort of um, Jupiter mass things to uh, the boundary between planets and stars, which is about 10 times the mass of Jupiter. Um, so there are a lot of, there's everything in the middle um, there. So. Yeah, so I think when I, I read about this last year for a talk that I had to give, and I think it's hard to do. Um, there are some special conditions where they could form alone, but a more likely hypothesis probably is that they formed uh, like planets around another star system and then got launched out um, in some violent event. I'll maybe add really quickly, um, one way that planets can get ejected from their solar systems is that they have some kind of interaction with another star that comes by and disrupts the system. So this is like a three body kind of interaction that happens um, and kicks things out. So this is more likely to happen in a place where there are lots of stars. Um, the Orion cluster where this, these observations took place fits the bill of this is something that was like a very dense region with lots of stars and lots of stuff happening. So the potential for three body interactions is high. So you might expect to have more ejected planets in this particular area than you would just generally. Um, but again, this is, could also happen just within the solar system as well um, as things are forming. Yeah, and we, uh, these observations, we found lots of planets with them, but um, that doesn't mean that there aren't planets like this in other places. It's just that uh, because they're young, the planets are still really hot, and so they're easy to see. But there, this is probably just an indication that there are tons and tons of, of these free-floating planets everywhere. Yes. Um, in studying exoplanets, are there planets like very different from our solar system, like not just giant gas and, and just rocks? Like, are there different properties and how weird can other planets be? How weird can an exoplanet be? Very weird. Um, yeah, so 30 years of discoveries has basically shown that our solar system is actually the unusual one. Um, so for example, the, a very, very common type of planet in the galaxy um, is between the size of Earth and Neptune. So there's no known planet in our solar system that has that size. Um, so they're, they're kind of like bigger Earths, we call them super Earths, or miniature Neptunes, we call them mini Neptunes or sub-Neptunes. Um, so those are really, really common types of planets. Um, there just isn't one around our sun, as far as we know. Um, and then they also come in uh, different orbits, so uh, many Planetary systems around other stars have planets that are very close to their sun. Um, that you know, the closest planet to the sun in in our solar system is Mercury, but uh, many systems have like five planets all within the orbit of Mercury. Um, so that's really different and, and unexpected. Um, and there are many other examples. For example, like the the planets in our solar system have very circular orbits, um, but orbits don't have to be circular. They can also be elliptical, elongated. Um, and so we find, we do find like planets around other stars on very, very elongated orbits. So they will be very far from their star and then they zip by very close to the star and then they go far away again. Um, and, and those are actually really good tracers of some sort of violent event in the past that destabilized their orbit and put them in this, in this weird elliptical orbit. So there's a whole zoo of, of exoplanets that uh, has really expanded our conception of what we think planets can be. Additional questions? There's one, one here. Um, oh yeah, people were asking about this new result. So there was a paper that came out in the last week or two indicating that there might be evidence for, so we talked about the giant impactor, uh, giant impactor hypothesis for what caused the moon. Right now, the most popular way uh, that people agree, well, roughly agree that the moon was created was in the early solar system, the earth was going, doing its own thing, uh, orbiting around the, the sun, and out of nowhere, uh, some Mars-ish size impactor ran into it, 
slammed into it, hit it so hard that that impactor basically vaporized into molten rock and vapor rock, and then kind of part of it formed in the earth and part of earth got splashed out and eventually it coalesced into the moon um, in, in its orbit. But there was a paper that came out, did you guys see this? That there seems to be evidence for that impactor for, still inside the earth in some large-ish form. Um, I'm trying to remember, you didn't see, did you? Yeah, okay. Well, there were questions about it. Um, I think Steve Desch was one of the co-authors on it. The consensus is that Earth form, or the moon formed by a giant impact. So the fact that there's more evidence for that is a, is a good thing. It means we're probably on the right track. Agreed. Um, we're kind of at the end of the night. I'm getting, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty beat and we've kind of run out of questions. Thank you for sticking around. Um, please, please thank our speaker again. Uh, wonderful presentation, Yu Ping, and our panelists, Max and Sam. Thanks everybody for sticking around. We will have our next event, as I mentioned before, our next one of these will be three weeks from tonight on uh, December 8th, and it will be on the, oh, why do I keep forgetting all of these things? It'll be on the topic of what? On uh, black holes, yeah. It'll be on the topic of black holes, but not just any black holes, it's gonna be on black black holes. And what I mean by that is, oftentimes the way that we detect black holes is because they happen to be feeding on stuff and so there's a region around them called the accretion disk which is glowing very brightly and we can see it at vast distances but those are really a very small handful of all the black holes that are out there much more likely most black holes are just hanging out doing their own thing kind of lurking and and it's very difficult to detect those black holes and so the presentation will primarily be about the lurking black holes as opposed to the the screaming black holes that make themselves more more visible. So, um, so that will be in three weeks, and then two and a half weeks will be our next astronomy on tap, given by Sam Rose of our panel, um, as well as another member of the, of the department working on Project Starshot. So, so that will be super cool. So, uh, thanks for everybody for sticking around, and we'll see you guys next time. Have a good night. <laughs>